Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire to Lead, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua Double Underscore Stamper. Aspire leaders, I have the amazing opportunity to speak with a phenomenal leader who's been a teacher, school and district administrator, educational consultant, and now she's got author on that list. I'm so excited to have Megan Lawson on with me as we're going to be talking a lot of different topics on leadership, but then also about her brand new book, like I said, Legacy of Learning, Teaching for Lasting Impact. And Megan, first off, congratulations on the brand new book. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. And what an honor it is to join you here. I know I've personally benefited from listening to you and some of the incredible inspiring leaders that you've had on this podcast. So thank you so much for having me today. Well, those are kind words, Megan. I I don't take that lightly. So thank you so much. (laughs) And so we had talked previously about our roles and just the busyness. I know for you launching a brand new book, I bet a thousand people are trying to get after you and, and asking for interviews and whatnot. And I even saw you have a book study And for myself, you know, through the years as an educational leader, I have always tried my best to sustain energy throughout the day. And I've had a really difficult time. So if anyone knows, I am go, go, go all the time. I rarely stop to eat. I do eat, but it's usually on the run. And then also I love my coffee, right? So I've had sponsors on this podcast that are coffee companies, but I'm always looking for something a little bit different. And one of those things that I've tried before was an energy drink maybe completely jittery. And then it was like, okay, I'm going to have three cups of coffee. And then that was too much because then I was staying up too late at night. And I was also feeling gross, like just disgusting. And then I also was having too much sugar because I was like throwing down candy and all this nastiness that was in the staff lounge and in the school front office. And the the sugar made me crash in the afternoon. So I was like, okay, I got to find a way to get my energy up. So Megan, is this something that you struggle with? I do. It's funny that you mentioned that about different things making you feel funny. I uh, am somebody who enjoys working out. And I know for me, if I take a a pre-workout, it makes me feel like my skin is actually crawling. So I think it's important to find something that is uh, healthy uh, and also gives you the boost you need for sure. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you said healthy because I know for myself, I'm not getting any younger. And so I'm trying to find some healthy choices. And so what I've landed on is this brand new drink. It's it's very small. It's called Magic Mind. And I've been throwing this down. And so what I've been doing is for my routine is pairing it with my coffee. So yes, I got to have my coffee in the morning. That's that's not going away. But I do need that boost to get me that energy in the afternoons. And so this kind of extends that. And I have found this to be a wonderful routine. So I want to make sure that my audience is finding that energy. I know my administrators are running around like crazy. So, you know, if you're looking for something that's got a great supply of natural ingredients and you're also looking for that sustained energy boost, I've got some for you. So this little magic mind, I've got a partnership here with this company. So if you go to magicmind.com slash aspire, and I'm going to throw this up if you're watching on YouTube, there's a link there and use the code aspire 20, you can get up to 56% off your subscription and that's for the next 10 days. So I want to make sure that my audience takes advantage of this because it's very important to be healthy. It's also important to have that energy boost so that you can be the best for your students, for your parents, and for your community. And Megan, so excited to have this conversation with you Thank today. You so, so all right, let's talk about your leadership journey because this, I said it at the very beginning, it's vast. And you've done, it seems like everything under the under the sun as far as education. So would you just mind sharing real quick about your educational leadership journey? Sure. I've never been someone who has been focused on titles uh, or climbing some kind of proverbial ladder. I'm uh, someone who just wants to do work I believe in with people I enjoy. And uh, I really am a lover of learning who believes in the goodness of people. And that has led me into some incredible spaces with some really talented, mission-driven, um, incredible human beings in our profession. So for me, you know, I started my career as a high school English teacher. And uh, my journey into education is is actually not an inspiring one. I've heard people talk about, um, you know, my parents were teachers and I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. Or I played school growing up or I got into teaching because I had a hard experiences myself, and I wanted to get in there and change what school could be. I actually was a classically trained dancer, so I wanted to move to New York, 
dance on Broadway, live out of a backpack, you know, just live that dream. And I was raised by a very practical single mom who said, that's wonderful, but that's, you know, can be very challenging to do and you need a backup plan and you don't need a college degree to do that. So, you know, begrudgingly, I chose um, a major and, you know, started my career as an uninspiring start to my career. But I, I've learned that experience is needed in order to develop passion. And so in my case, I the more experience that I've had in this profession and opportunities I've had to learn from so many incredible educators and students in my classroom, the more my passion has, has grown for our profession. So I started in the high school uh, English classroom as a ninth grade English teacher. And uh, I, I will be the first to admit that I chose high school because I thought that people would think I was smart and impressive by teaching high school. And I learned very quickly how hard it is to to be a great teacher, no matter what level uh, you're teaching at, but um, also how important it is. I think that's what's kept me coming back. So after about four years of teaching high school, I uh, realized that, you know, maybe a different grade level will be a good fit for me, a different level altogether. And I'm seventh through 12 certified, landed in the seventh grade English classroom. And that's where I learned in the middle school how to be a good teacher and uh, how to manage all kinds of um, things in the classroom and kids at a variety of developmental levels. And I learned how to get over myself a little bit and instead realize, you know, that uh, behavior was communication and feedback for me and how to make things fun and interesting for all of us. And so I had a principal at the time in the middle school who said, you know, have you ever thought about becoming a principal? And I remembered saying to her at the time, I believe my exact words were, why would anyone want to do your job? Your job looks terrible. And she said, no, you know, if you really, uh, there are many ways to make an impact outside of your classroom, not just through administration, but one way um, is, you know, through uh, school administration. So I became an assistant principal at a middle school and, and left to go to a district office role for a while. Then I was a consultant at an educational service center. And at that time, there was a school that needed a principal and they contracted me out to be an elementary principal for the, for the year. And that was pretty cool. It was the year COVID hit. Wow, what a wild ride that was. After that, I fell in love with the district I was was in for that role, and they had this role open up, which I'm currently serving in as the director of secondary teaching and learning at a school district here in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. All right. So, Megan, I love having guests on with like a variety of different titles to the name and leadership, and that's one that I know looks different in each district and in different states. So for your role right now, what does that entail? Like, what are your... What are you over and what are you working with? That's a great question. I think there are a lot of people who are like, what do you do every day? Right? Because <laughs> yeah. those words, teaching and learning could be a million different things. Right. So one area that I uh, lead in is in the area of special education. Yep. Uh, the other area, when you think about you know curriculum, instruction, assessment, I work very closely with principals and instructional coaches and building leadership teams and a variety of capacities, uh, including looking at our um, curriculum, but also um, you know, professional learning for teachers and uh, something that's really important to me. I, I know I've used a lot of big words, you know, about titles and big, like, you know, oh, wow, that sounds like big work or something. But at the end of the day, if nothing else, you know, there's two things that I hope people would know would be true about me. One is I think we, the word we is really important in this work. And I get to work on some incredible teams and there's nothing that I ever, ever achieved that I didn't do with a group of people. Um, and we all share uh, pride in our work together. But also I think teachers create what they experience as Katie Martin would say in her book, Learner Centered Innovation. And I hope that by taking really great care of teachers and their learning, they're more equipped than to take great care of students and their learning. Well, let's talk about that because, you know, being in a district role, obviously you are over a lot of different folks in the district. And so, you know, you were talking about that team aspects. So how do you get that instilled as far as like, we're here for the collective whole versus our own individual achievements? Hmm. I love that question. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with some of Sean Aker's work. Yes. Okay. So happiness researcher out of Harvard and in some of his books, like Big Potential, as an example, he talks a lot about what it looks like to achieve together versus as an individual. And I think a lot of our work historically, we celebrate individual achievement, right? Like when you're, we were growing up, a lot of us were really proud for the individual, you know, grades and accolades, right. And awards and, 
and all of that is wonderful. But I think when we work together uh, and we amplify the strengths that people bring into our ecosystems and leverage each other's strengths for the collective good, we can go um, further together. And he talks a lot about what he calls the super bounce um, of, po of positivity, where if you're uh, on a trampoline and you're jumping on that trampoline by yourself, you can go pretty high and pretty far. If someone else is jumping with you and you time it right, you can actually catapult yourself um, to new heights. And so I've been really interested in what that looks like, you know, in the school community. And so I think for me, it's I think I have a lot of fun leveraging meetings and other things that people typically find to be a, a really big drag. You know, a lot of people don't look forward to the meetings that they have, but meetings can be a great way to amplify our sense of togetherness and community while also moving important hard work forward because we are in it together, figuring it out and making real things happen for kids. And so I'm just really passionate about leading meetings that are fun and get the work done. I was smiling because I'm visualizing that trampoline. I don't know if you've seen on social media where there's like four people on the trampoline and they time it and the person like launches like three stories up and it makes me so nervous and they make it look so easy. But I, I love that because it's true. It's the, the teen concept. And so many times in society, it's trying to pull a single person out and, and give them the accolades and, and talk about even in a team sport or something like that, that, you know, they're the reason that a team won or went on. It's true. It's, it takes everybody to participate and have that rhythm, like you said, with the trampoline to make sure that we're getting to new heights. So love that idea. Now you had talked about positivity and kind of happiness uh, with your reference uh, to several different resources. So I want to talk a little bit about the positivity component. So as far as the learning process goes, is there anything that you're instilling to try to make that like a more positive place for your students, for your teachers and for your staff? Yeah, I'm sure I'm going to sound like a Sean Aker spokesperson. <laughs> so inspired by his work, uh, you know, he would say that your brain on positive is 31% more productive than it wow. is at negative, neutral, or stress. So if you think about 31%, I mean, that's very significant. And mm -hmm. yet of all the data that we have in our schools, measuring happiness levels is not does not tend to be the kind of data that we have at the table. Um, no. Because often what is most essential is hardest to measure. And yeah. so... A few ways that we really try to amplify um, that sense of, of positivity and togetherness in school. One uh, being uh, every Wednesday in our school district, our uh, district building administrators and coaches, and now some teachers have come along and even students uh, in some weeks, we go into what we call instructional rounds. I think though a lot of people hear instructional rounds are learning walks and they find that super terrifying because they've had some kind of traumatic experience or they got some kind of feedback that felt very disconnected with what they were trying to do or this person has no idea, you know, what they should be looking for, or what was really happening here. But in our case, it, it's really more like a, a celebration of great work. So we lean on uh, Mike Rutherford's 30 second feedback protocol and uh, what we do is first thing we make sure we do is there's only two of us going in a classroom at a time so that we're not like fish bowling this entire room and overwhelming the students and teachers in that classroom. But we, uh, what he encourages you to do is you go into the classroom and you don't try to tiptoe in there. Uh, like you're already a disruption. So go ahead and lean into it. Wave. Hi, good to see you. Great. And then you keep your eye out for just things that look interesting to you. And then when you find something that you want to know more about, you try to move a little closer to it. So like if you see a teacher at a kidney table working with a small group of students, you might move yourself closer to that table just so you can hear more clearly what the students are saying, what the teachers saying, the different uh, moves that they're using in that lesson with the students. And then after spending some nice time with that, you you fill out a post-it note. And it's very simple. The formula is this. And I have this is included actually in my book. So there's a cushion like, hi, thanks so much for having us. And then there's sort of cause and effect, right? Or, or teaching and then learning. So when you ask students to turn and talk, the energy in the room went up and learning was more accessible. Nice move. You just kind of bring it to a close at the end. We have so many teachers who save those post-it notes. I mean, it's such a small move, but they know that when we're in their classroom that they're going to get some very specific intentional feedback about an actual move that they made that was impactful for students. You know, I think teaching while they're with kids all day, teachers can feel really isolated. It's often they're the only adult in the room. And so letting them know that we see you, we appreciate you, 
for this very specific thing that's adding value is one way, just one small move that I think can make a tremendous impact. And I'll, I'll say we also have like a little form we fill out when we get into the hallway that we'll use to kind of, and it's not, doesn't have any teacher names on it or anything like that, but to help us get a feel for, you know, what kinds of instructional strategies are we seeing a lot? What are we seeing less of? And what does that make us wonder for how we might support teachers with professional learning in the future? But it's amazing how much of an impact, a kind word, a post-it note, just acknowledging how impactful that can be. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. So before we dive into your book, because you had mentioned it, and I'm kind of itching to to get after that resource and that beautiful text of yours. But I want to know, since you're working with so many teachers, what are some small things that they can do in the classroom that you feel is a giant impact for student learning? I love that you asked this. So to start, I think it's going to sound so simple. And for many people, this is just a reminder of something that they already know to be true. But I think it's really important for both adult learners and students to hear their name at school. And I think in the secondary side, a lot of times our teachers have a lot of students in the day and kids move through a lot of classes with a lot of different teachers. And I know our staff know our students' names and can use them correctly, but I don't know for sure how many of our kids know each other's names in their classes and are using them every day. And so that's one small move, ensuring that, you know, after the first week of school, getting to know you activities as we move into the more rigorous, uh, you know, content work that we don't forget uh, to continue to build community and ensure that kids are known. What originally got me interested in this, there's a, a survey from Battelle for Kids, a student experience 21. And one of the questions is, do you feel like if somebody would notice if you weren't at school today kind of a thing? And I think it's not just about teachers noticing and appreciating students and creating belonging. It's about all of us in our community, whether it's staff to staff or student to student. So that's one thing that I've been thinking about. And, and along with that goes even just greeting students at the door. I know that that is something that we all believe is important, but is really easy to lose. And I certainly don't want someone to miss their restroom break, you know, or those copies that they have to grab really quickly off the copier. But, you know, there's a lot of research that would show that students, their engagement goes up in the classroom when the teacher greets them, kind of spends that short little amount of time with them in the hallway. Time to task goes up by, uh, I think, 20%, but also discipline uh, can de decrease by 9%. I got that, you know, from an Edutopia article that I thought was really compelling. That doesn't require hardly any planning, but it certainly requires daily commitment. Other things, you know, uh, I think the sweet spot for putting students in groups, grades three and higher is supposed to be three. I was somebody who just always put kids in pairs or put them in fours as a teacher. I don't know why. I guess I just really liked even numbers. I wish I had stumbled upon that sooner. And also just the value of movement in the classroom, you know, and uh, non-permanent vertical surfaces, as you would hear about in building thinking classrooms for mathematics. Not to be dissuaded by that title because anybody could learn uh, so much from that book, but allowing kids to talk about the math um, or about the content while, you know, working on something that feels lower stakes because, you know, you can erase it or it's just, you know, a piece of poster paper tends to, to increase learning. So those are just some examples of moves that I see great teachers making every day that are small, that don't require a heavy lift on the planning side, but can have a big impact on student achievement. Yeah, I love those suggestions so much, Megan. Those are wonderful. And I love that you have the data to back that up. And yeah, students and teachers, everyone in the building, they're longing for connection. And so it's important to, like you said, not only have that for the student with the teacher relationship, but then also student to student. So there's ways that we can do that in the classroom to enhance their experience. And that connection, I think, is so beneficial. Love those. All right, let's transition to your wonderful book that just launched Legacy of Learning, Teaching for Lasting Impact. Megan, I want to know what inspired this idea and who did you write this book for? Awesome. Uh, so I uh, blog every week. Uh, that's for me as a learner. Uh, that was something that George Kuros has encouraged so many educators to do that yes. he's inspired. <laughs> and so I just, you know, started writing to make sure that I had created a reflection space for myself and could go back into my thinking and also see my uh, thinking evolve over time as I'm exposed to more stimulus and, and the smart work of other people. So 
I've been doing that for over three years now, but about a year and a half in, I started to notice themes emerge about what I was writing about. And there was sort of this thread. And it, it just occurred to me that I wonder if this is a book because I seem to you know, really care about these things and, and be talking about them a lot. And so that was really the inspiration uh, for this for this book. And as far as like, people that it's for, it's it's for anybody working in a school, really. It's it's for teachers. It might be for people leading teachers. I think the themes, when I talk about that thread or the themes that come up, I think a lot of us are feeling overworked, overstimulated. Um, we found a way to overcomplicate a lot of the aspects of what this profession is. And I don't think it needs to be complicated to be impactful. And so this book is about you know, making that meaningful impact that we all desire while also um, ensuring that the work is manageable and fun. There's so many people who will say, you know, man, these jobs used to be fun. And they can be fun and we can make an impact and we can do all of that without losing ourselves in the process. And I tried to write an honest book, not a heroic one. It's just my own journey in order to write a book that I thought might make any kind of difference to even just one person reading it. I had to be real about it. And so it required some vulnerability on my part and talking about some of the, you know, it's not like a Britney Spears tell all or anything like that, but it certainly does not make <laughs> me look like I had it all together because I, I didn't and I still don't. You're not dancing with knives, Megan? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> well, let's talk about that transparency because, you know, even before we push record, you know, uh, you had talked about like, I'm not a perfect educator. I've made mistakes. So, you know, is there something that you wrote in the book that you felt like, you know what, I struggle with this. I know a lot of teachers or educators are going to if they're young or inexperienced or maybe just in their journey. And I want to make sure that they don't make the same mistake I did. Is there something that you could pull from that book and just share with my audience real quick? No, oh, I'd love to. There's a lot of things that I wrote about. Oh, I figured I, there was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you nailed that. So even perfectionism itself, there's a whole sure. chapter and another chapter that's adjacent to that one that is about uh, people pleasing or seeking the approval of others or perfectionism. And my own working definition of perfectionism, and I don't claim to be some kind of expert. I'm sure there's no thesaurus that could support uh, you know, the words and definition that I'm going to provide. But for me, perfectionism is not just about being obsessed with getting it right. My version of perfectionism is sometimes having unrealistic expectations for both myself and the timeline in which I can achieve something um, or the th amount of things I can achieve well at one time. And so, like I said earlier, I was a classically trained dancer. So being in the ballet world, you know, everything is about placement and everything being perfect and every little detail needing to be exactly right. And I carried some of those habits with me into our profession. And I think for a lot of teachers who did really well in school, as an example, you know, got good grades and turned everything in on time and, you know, received that praise from their teachers, we sort of came in with these expectations that like that was how teaching was going to go and that we like we're going to just know what to do at the right time and make the right decision. And um, and there's no room really then for play and creativity and the messy part of learning if we expect that we're going to do something, we're going to execute perfectly on the first try. And the truth is our kids don't need people, shiny, perfect people who execute things perfectly on the first try. They need deeply human people who are going to model what it looks like to be a learner and to love yourself through the process of growing and evolving. Yeah, that's a hard lesson for teachers in, in general, I, myself included. And yeah, as a leader, I was always trying to tell my teachers, like, it's okay. Like, if you make a mistake, just own it in front of the kids. And that's modeling appropriate adult behavior. <laughs> you know, like, even just that small thing means a lot to kids, because they're not going to put you on a pedestal and think you're perfect. That's That's not it's not possible. So like you said, learning is messy. So lean into that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I was humbled and with a seventh grade student to give you a story of the kind of stories that you might see in my book. And I noticed that I was teaching a lesson and that it's never a good sign if you see a middle schooler keeping tally marks on something, right? <laughs> like, what are they keeping track of right now? Eek. I've seen this happen before. <laughs> Have you? I know. It's like my heart dropped. Uh-oh. What's happening in this room that I am not tuned into right now? Yeah. And it was me. He was keeping track of the number of vocal fillers I was using when I was talking to the class, the number of likes and the number of ums, so much so that he differentiated the two. So we had the tally marks for the number of likes, the tally marks for the number of ums. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that there were a lot of tally marks. It was great feedback. It just did not make its way to me in a way that felt good. <laughs> so I asked him, you know, if he came back, because I wanted to ask him a couple questions at the end of class. So the class clears out. And I said, I, you know, I 
I noticed that we were keeping some tally marks and of course his face is getting all red. And I said, no, no, this is really great feedback for me. I had no idea that I was using that many vocal fillers. I said, the thing that I was hoping we can work on together is how that feedback is given to me. And because the way I, it came about, it just was really hard for me to receive it. Just sort of noticing you kind of chuckling to yourself <laughs> while I'm trying to teach my lesson. I mean, those are just some examples of teaching has this beautiful way of humbling you and reminding you of how, you know, not perfect you are. And even the way I handled that situation, I tell the story in the book that I had this great moment with him. And at, at the end of it, I said, I was trying to lighten it up because his face was very red. I was, you know, the next time that I'm grading papers in this class, I, I didn't realize that perfection was a standard. Like, I'm going to remember that, you know, the next time that I, I grade your paper. And I laughed and I said, you know, I'm just kidding, you know, kind of thing. But like that sounded punitive. It sounded like a sure. little bit like I was going to be like retaliating. And I think sometimes, you know, we hide behind sarcasm a little bit and it can tear down relationships. And I think that's an example of a story that I just go ahead and name for people, like both that I struggled with vocal fillers. I had a kid who was keeping track of it in class, but also I didn't per handle perfectly that situation. And I learned to handle it differently in different contexts in the future. So, wow. If it makes you feel any better, Megan, my first year teaching, I had the exact same thing happen, but it was with using the filler okay. So I was nervous, you know, in front of my students and someone took the tally marks, but then he decided to announce it to the class as to oh. how many times it said okay. And I just said, thanks, buddy. I'll, I'll make sure I do better next time. And I kind of left it at that. And I think I turned red uh, as he was announcing it to the class because I was a little embarrassed by that. But yeah, but I mean, middle school students you had, you know, I mean, like you acknowledged it and you yeah. said, I'm going to work on it. I thought it was <laughs> yeah. wonderful. You didn't say, I'm going to remember that the next time I grade your paper. I'm going to get you, buddy. You just wait. Right. After school, outside. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, especially I, I worked in middle school for forever. And so whatever comes in their mind, they're going to say it. So you just got to take it in a grain of salt. So, absolutely. all right, Megan, I, I just have enjoyed this conversation so much. I don't want it to end, but uh, I do want to ask you something that I asked all my guests. So for our aspiring and current leaders, if there's something they can do tomorrow, next week to enhance their leadership journey, what would you advise them to do? I would advise them to put on their sneakers and roll up their sleeves and get in the work with people. For me, there's, I don't know how to lead differently, uh, especially for those of you who might be listening who are in district office roles. It is really easy to make assumptions about what's needed in schools and what's happening in schools, unless yep. you put yourself in the work alongside people. I would say just get in there and listen and and try to be of some kind of support. Yeah, it's hard to <laughs> hard to assess what's going on when if you're not there personally and, and seeing it firsthand. So great advice. Megan, I want my folks to, you know, one, pick up your book as quickly as possible, but also I want them to connect with you either on your website or on social media. So will you just share how they may get in contact with you? Absolutely. So I love connecting with and learning from educators. So I hope that people um, reach out to me and that we can follow each other. My best learning comes from people in the classroom and people leading schools. So I, you, you can follow me at MeganLawson.com um, where I blog weekly. You can follow me on Instagram uh, at Megan Lawson blog, or you can follow me on X uh, Megan underscore Lawson. And my uh, first name, my mom wanted to make it complicated for people. It does have an H in it, a silent H. So it's M-E-G-H-A-N. It's unique. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, if you want to see not only Megan Lawson in person, but her furry friend, <laughs> you can definitely check us out on YouTube, on the new YouTube channel, Joshua Stamper, and then also, of course, on the Teach Better team YouTube page, we'll have the video up there. And then I know Megan was talking about the spelling of her name. So if you want all those links, as far as you know, how to connect with Megan, maybe click on the link to get her brand new book, you can go to joshstamper.com in the show notes too. If you're on a podcast platform, it'll be there. And like I said before, if you need a burst of energy, magic minds for you, so you can go to joshstamper.com. I'll have the link there with the code aspire 20. If you forget, you know how to access that it'll be all that information will be there for you and every way you can to get connected with the wonderful megan lawson and i just wanted to thank you so much i know you had said that you've been a listener of the podcast and that just means the world to me especially coming from someone who is making such an impact not only in the district but all over this country and i am just so proud and amazed by your work and this brand new book so thank you so much for being a guest on aspire to lead i really enjoyed it thank you so so much for having me 